I think you've got it. I can see levels on your uh, receiver there. Um, hi, I'm Julian. I, these days I work downstairs here as a network engineer, um, managing a couple of the largest networks on the planet, um, which oddly enough has, has caused me to have less to do with time and all the vagaries thereof than I've had in the past. Um, get to some of that later. the clearly very bad decision to upgrade my Mac the other day and uh, somewhat regretting it. Um, so first you have a history of timekeeping over essentially the human era. Um, this is mainly covering, this first part is mainly covering commercial clocks, um, those you can buy, not the research lab standards, although those are shiny, usually containing lots of very shiny metal, they're not things and put in our server rooms. Um, the broad concept of this section is stolen from Tom Van Bach of, of leapsecond.com, who you should totally go read his site if you've never seen it, including such things as the actual atomic wristwatch, which was a HP cesium clock strapped to his brother's wrist. Um, that's about a 40 pound box, so uh, 20 kilo odd for those who don't speak American. Yeah, and the only one that people might have heard of is, is, is this uh, John Wired uh, uh, clock that was made in 1982. Uh, so he took his kids on vacation up the mountain with three atomic clocks and XYZ orientations to prove the uh, prove relativity by different time differentiation, you, comparing against his lab clocks, which were back in his house. He's, he's a great bug. So really simple clock starting off with, you've got your heartbeat. If you're resting, it's actually not that horrible. Um, and it's pretty much a pulse per second. Now, of course, not really all that useful. Um, as we started to develop uh, in the music, we got tuning forks. Tuning forks you can get about 1% accurate. Some of them get a little bit better, 0.1% accurate. Um, this particular example is actually a mechanical tuning, tuning fork project from the One Laptop Per Child teaching archives. Uh, we're missing our OLPC. Yeah. Um, so you can excite these coils via magnetic uh, impulse or other mechanisms and essentially keep them at their resonant frequency and use that as your clock. Um, next and probably most common, especially for the older in the audience, is the use of the power grid for time synchronous for timekeeping and frequency keeping. The grid is actually kept surprisingly close to 50 hertz. The deviation from the nominal frequency is actually used as part of the mechanism that controls uh, load on the grid. Just simple, the way AC power works means when you load it down, it slow, the motor, the generator is driving it slow down. Um, and that's kept very controlled, but it's used as a measure of how loaded the grid is. Uh, many decades ago, AC-powered clo wall clocks and mantel clocks and such were very common, where you had an AC synchronous motor that would run at exactly the speed of the grid. Uh, and in fact, the grids were often controlled with a a nice good old grandfather clock that was considerably more accurate and or considerably more stable sorry, and an electric clock and they would actually during periods of light load where they could do this sort of shift speed up or slow down the grid slightly to try and even out time and keep people using a wall clock have keeping them having roughly reasonable time. Um, the UK the British grid is actually, you can view the 
a bunch of stats among with the frequency uh, at dynamicdemand.co.uk. If you like shiny dashboards that mean absolutely nothing to those of us in Australia. Um, and as a reference for accuracy, the Australian grid is meant to be kept to basically plus or minus 0.09%. So not too bad. Um, next is something we probably all carry several of. A whole bunch of them. Uh, classic crystal oscillators. Uh, these are comparatively large packages for most things we would carry. The ones in watches or mobile phones, laptops, PDAs, uh, very tiny, sort of much smaller than the size of your pinky nail. These are about a part per million accurate. So you lose a second about every week or two, which for most things turns out to be perfectly good enough. Um, this is, yeah, as I said, in your phone, uh, although it's not used Normally, it's not actually used for tracking the cellular frequencies. That's done slightly differently. That usually tracks the network. Um, but it's used to give it a start, and it's used to run the computers inside. Uh, devices that are in very well temperature controlled environments, like servers, actually go slightly more accurate, simply by virtue of being in a nicely environmentally consistent environment. Uh, not necessarily. They might be. Um, certainly there's packages of Arvin and various t control oscillators in that size, but there's also straight crystal oscillators in that size. Um, it could well be. It might not be. I didn't actually look up those part numbers. Um, I would have a note somewhere on where I stole that image from, but I don't know offhand. So, Uh, some of the packages are historical. So, although now used for more accurate crystals, they were th those packages were developed. Um, there's, for those who like the Prelinger archives and similar histories, there's some really great uh, documentaries from the, from the World War II era of building crystal oscillators into essentially valve casings, uh, vacuum tubes. And Although the actual fraction needed is that tiny minuscule fraction of a couple of millimeters, if that, these are sort of inch diameter valves, a couple of inches long, because that's how they needed to make them back in the day. So, I mean, they've been miniaturized since, but there's equipment that's that old that's mostly still in museums, but there is a lot of equipment that's old, older than some of those packages that's. Um, if not still in production, still the best of its type. A, a lot of old test equipment from the 70s and into the 80s is, and through the 90s, there, there's a really golden period of test equipment that is not being bettered. And they'll have things like that for the lower end kit. For the higher end, you'll see some examples later. So even, even though something might be obsolete, it's still, still surprisingly value. Um, so yeah, the, ne the next step to make these oscillators more accurate is to first add a temperature sensor and by using previous measurements compensate for the drift of the oscillator from temperature by what we think is happening. The next step above that is adding an oven and keeping it at a solid temperature so it, you get more consistency. Uh, there's also voltage control where you control the supply voltages and again in an aim to be more consistent to what you give the oscillator to compensate for its own drift. Good mechanical clocks are actually better than the majority of crystal oscillators. A good mechanical clock will cost a lot more than a good than even a quite decent crystal oscillator but they are actually very good. A couple of seconds a year, if that. So next, the final step in the mechanical clocks are the grandfather clock styles. These are actually 
essentially gravitometers. Your me time is a side effect of measuring, measuring gravity here. And the really great ones here are isolated for, from temperature, from humidity, from pressure. There's the, the knowledge of metals, of frictions, of all those elements of the physical world needed to construct them are really quite impressive. Um, that particular clock is the short free pendulum clock. You can look it up on Wikipedia. It's one of the most accurate physical clocks ever made, at least historically. Uh, I think if I'm right, they're actually both part of the same clock. I, yeah, I've gone through and checked half of this, uh, gone through and updated half of this deck and the other half I've sort of left and the mind has wandered a little. So actually more accurate than those clocks, I mean, by virtue of the fact that they're measuring gravity and getting time as a side effect, the Earth's rotation is actually slightly more accurate than those clocks. In theory, it, it averages out that way, but it's, it's not. And it's got drift. Um, some of you may have heard of leap seconds, and I'll mention that more later. But leap seconds are essentially us compensating for the drift of the, drift of the Earth's rotation. And it's pretty much slowing down. It not, doesn't always just slow down. It can speed up a little bit on occasion. But mostly the direction is downwards. So yeah, then we come back to crystal oscillators. The very best, the very best made crystal oscillators are about 0.1 parts per billion drift. These are, you're well under the second per year category here. Uh, that's the HP 10811 which is essentially if you bought nice HP or Agilent equipment or in fact several other vendors over the last 30 years, um, maybe not in the last 10, and specified the high quality oscillator option, you got one of those. And they are, in terms of widely available oscillator, crystal oscillators, they are one of the best commercially available. And then we get into atomic clocks. So this, this is a um, palette of rubidium clocks. Uh, rubidium vapor is essentially used uh, in part of a lamp where it's heated up and the measurement of the frequency that's generated from that is used. These can actually get really small. So that HP was, on the previous slide, was about maybe the size of your fist. The smallest commercial rubidiums are about three centimeters by three centimeters by a centimeter. So they're getting pretty tiny. Not yet where you'd want to wear a watch, wear one as a watch. Um, not the least of which because rubidium and water don't go well together. Not that there's a lot of them. Um, these were installed by the thousand as part of CDMA mobile networks. And as those networks are being either retired in most parts of the world or refreshed with new equipment, these, um, these clocks are being ripped out by the surplus dealers and sold. So you can actually pick them up used for less than 100 bucks. There are a whole lot of caveats about that. Um, Silicon Chip did a couple of articles over the last year or two um, summarizing many of this, but it really comes down to there's a lot of submodels that often aren't on the label. So be prepared, you might actually need to buy a couple of them. You might end up buying from a vendor who will deliver you known broken units and not care. If you happen to want a really good, a really good source of frequency for timing, these are not straight clocks, they're more straight frequency sources. And although time and frequency are just reciprocals, there's this is not something you can just plug into your PC and make time better. It's something you use in a lab that's working on microwave systems or similar to improve things. Some of us have them because we like toys. 
Uh, so rubidium is a form of atomic clocks. Time is actually defined by the state, the hyperfine, third hyperfine cesium transition. I think it's the third. Anyway, but so the cesium atom is has a transition state when excited and it essentially has a resonant frequency of about 9.5 gigahertz. It's 9.65 something, I think, actually. It's measuring that frequency, and in fact, the number of transitions a second is the definition of a second. So in a very real sense, a fully working cesium clock, by definition, is correct. That's not strictly true because, of course, you can never get a perfect implementation. Um, but cesium clocks long term, so over periods of months or years, are essentially the best clocks money can buy. The uh, clock in that picture is a HP 5071A, uh, which went to Agilent, then Symmetricon bought their timing unit, and then Symmetricon are now Meisner, is it? I don't know, Symmetricom got acquired themselves quite recently. Um, and so the, the name on the plate has, has changed several times, but the equipment has stayed the same since 1997 when that was developed. It is the best commercial clock ever made, and given the way things are going, it doesn't seem likely to be improved, sadly. Not for a while. There's, so U UTC, might get to a bit later, is actually defined retrospectively by a pool of atomic clocks of various types around the world. Something like two-thirds of those clocks are 5071As. Uh, if you look up, if you're interested, you can look up photos of NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology in the US, and you will see photos of their timing labs, which are multi-isolation rooms for thermals, and you'll see half a dozen 5071As, a rack for half a dozen racks. And that's just one room. So they solved improving on this the way Google solves servers. Just do more of them. But you can improve on, in short terms. Um, this is a lab standard uh, of a hydrogen maser. So Maser is basically microwave laser. In fact, masers were around first. Mm, lasers were developed later. Uh, again, if you like nostalgia, there's some really great videos. Uh, the AT&T Archives YouTube channel is, wonderful, is a wonderful thing that you should totally spend many, many hours wondering. But one of the videos they have was the inventor of the maser from 40 or 50 or 60 years ago, discussing the, dis the discovery of the technology and how they work. And in fact, the same 20 or 30 years later for, the, for the researchers that are putting lasers into actual theoretical thought. Um, some of our employees here are actually Expel Labs, and I've had the discussion about test optical fibers being developed outside their office, which was rather cute. So yeah, mazes, shiny. Nice on a short term, hours, days maybe, but longer term cesiums are still more accurate. Um, commercial maser, maser standards, maybe about the size of a beer fridge. They're not that big. This, the lab standards, like the uh, lab atomic clocks, the cesium fountain designs you sometimes see referenced, they're big and crazy because they can be. They're in a lab, they need to be isolated for vibration and, and all and such. And they're not made to be mass produced, even on the scales of the couple of hundred. They're made to be made maybe two or three. So something that came out in the last couple of years, uh, it was actually brand new at the time I first gave this talk, is Symmetricom fin released what they'd been talking about for several years a chip scale atomic clock, which is somewhat interesting because it's not actually 
a cesium clock is those of us who work or those of us who understand them think of them. It's actually much more like the rubidium clocks, and in fact is about as accurate as the small rubidium clocks. It's just a different way of handling them. Um, so these are now available in volume production, and in fact they make use of very tiny uh, silicon-based lasers. The actual technology inside is really quite neat. The um, atomic clocks are sort of cute in that only two things in the world at their core are called a physics package. Atomic clocks and atomic bombs. Go figure. Um, and the physics package in that chip scale clock is less than a quarter of the entire... It's about full height. That unit is about... I think five, six mil high, and uh, I can't remember the coin size, but it's sort of most of for most of us our thumb would be about the same volume at least, and the physics package is about a quarter of it. The rest is supporting circuitry power supplies. It's it really is an incredible piece of miniaturization. So we have all those clocks. The next step is. Okay, so it's great that when I'm over there, I know what time it is. But I want to know what time it is over here, and we want to make sure we're all ticking at the same rate. So we synchronize the clocks. So the first, the first of these were master clocks. Uh, these came through, among other things, the old telegraph system. Uh, the common way these would run is you would have a pulse per hour that would trigger an electromagnet in the clocks to jolt them to the right time. So the actual clocks could be a couple of percent out, and it actually wouldn't matter. So the quality of the clock was not what mattered, at least the final stage clocks. The distribution clocks had to be a little better, and again, the master clocks were the wonderful, great old clock-making art of atomic clocks. Oh, uh, sorry, of grandfather clocks, not atomic clocks not existing. Um, another nostalgia item is looking up FRAC issue 30, which talks about the Western Union clocks distributed in the US, and there's some great details. Uh, that particular clock is from the Self-Winding Clock Company of New York City. So when we went more modern electronic, we came up with a standard called pulse per second. This is still used today as the ultimate timing reference. It's not used as a frequency reference. It's used to define here is the start of the second. And it is simply a pulse on the second. And most equipment that would trigger a pulse per second actually offers you a delay. And in fact, it offers you a negative delay so you can comp because the pulse is on the second at the output connector of the device. You add delay to compensate for the cable you're going to plug in. Which, of course, gets interesting if you want to distribute it, because, of course, you, can, you then need to try and match cable lengths, handle delay and distribution items, if you truly want accuracy. But we actually want to know what time it is, not just that second is passed, and running around and adjusting clocks is a pain. There's a couple of standards for this, but one that's sort of lived through, and in fact the one that's operating the, the display up the front here, is from a group of standards called IRIG, which is the Interrange Instrumentation Group, which was uh, the predecessors of NASA, White Sands Missile Range, and a couple of these other post-World War II, uh, Cold War, projects. And they needed a way to measure time on their rocketry and use countdown clocks, count up clocks once the mission is launched. Um, there's a wonderful video of a NASA launch of all the high-speed photography they take. All the cameras on those launches are synchronized with iRig. Uh, it may not be iRig B, which is the common, most commonly used form in general purpose timing. Is quite common. So I've actually got my laptop here just running some software, and that's generating IRIG B, just 
just at the sound port because it's essentially just audio run to the display. So in fact, as you can hear, that's, that sort of warbling tone is the modulation of our egg. Um, and if, if you want to know what time and you actually want to know really accurately what second, you put back in pulse per second. And in fact, there's an IREG form that is essentially just pulse per second. Maybe IREG A, I actually can't remember. So for a lot of test equipment, we don't actually care about time, we're back caring about frequency. So a lot of labs, and in fact a lot of test equipment, uh, microwave test equipment, oscilloscopes, spectrum analyzers, anything for which time and frequency are critical, will have reference clock inputs. And the most common standard these days is a 10 megahertz reference. Uh, older kit has 5 megahertz. Some of the multi-gigahertz rate RF stuff now uses uh, references of 100 megahertz or low gigahertz. But 10 megahertz is essentially the standard. So most rubidium clock references you'll find are 10 meg references. Some are 5 meg, some are odd frequencies used by cellular networks. In the world of production and broadcasting, there's a whole different set of time synchronization systems. These relate to the tape decks and video systems of the various eras they were developed in. Um, all of these are analog era systems. Uh, SMPTE is actually the name of the Society for Motion Picture and Telephone, Television Engineers, sorry. Too many overloaded acronyms. Uh, and they have a standard for synchronization, which is known as SMPTE timecode. Uh, there's a common video format, which is, has the nice effect of if you've paused, you still know what time it is. And there's a whole bunch of other ones. There's ones based on MIDI, ones based on other technologies. And these get accurate to a subframe, which is normally a small fraction of a second. Uh, usually a 20, a 50th or 60th, depending on your video rate. And there's some also some other technology called biphase and TAC, which are used for synchronizing mechanical ma magnetic tape drives for audio use. Uh, and then with digital audio, something got created called word clock, which is to ensure that all your digital audio, uh, analog to digital converters and digital to analog converters, are running at the same rate. Which doesn't seem like it would be a problem until you've got 60 channels on multiple boxes that are synchronized in various odd ways. So the way that actually works, even though it looks like it's a BNC cable and coax and doing strange things, is it uses a technology based on the AES-EBU, um, Audio Engineering Society, European Broadcast Union, digital audio stereo digital audio standard, um, which is actually almost identical if any of you have used SPDIF or TOSLINK on your home stereo. They're exactly the same except for a couple of bits. And that's used essentially just as a straight frequency synchronization. Now, we're computer people. We like making our computers talk to each other. There's a whole bunch of other protocols for this. Um, most of them historical proprietary, but the master of timekeeping for pretty much every computer on the planet that's not plugged into a cellular, net cellular network directly is NTP, the Network Time Protocol. Uh, version 1 dates back to 1985. Version 3 is the is that version 4? There's a version 4. Okay. Uh, 36, isn't it, with NTP? Round. So this is what your computers actually use to synchronize each other. Most PCs will actually use something called SNTP, or Simplified Network Time Protocol, which is just if you want to go, what is the time now here? Um, it does delay compensation. It's more complex than that, but I actually won't go into the full details of it. But so NTP and, in fact, some of the commercial telecom clocking 
have this concept of stratums, which is a master clock, a stratum zero, the NTP server that's actually connected to the master clock, and so on and so forth. Yeah, it's, yeah, I, I believe, yeah, I would have to reread RFCs and I've already had to do that too much this week for work. Uh, so telecom systems are for classic synchronous and plesiosynchronous data networks, which are now mostly, obs well, they're all obsolete. That doesn't mean they don't still exist. Um, have a slightly different concept of stratum relating to the accuracy of a clock. So you have a primary reference clock, a traditional teleco would have a couple of those, probably only a couple of those per country, used to synchronize the entire country. Then they'd have secondary clocks. So the primary clock would probably be a cesium clock in a big teleco. Secondary clocks might be rubidiums. These days they're basically all GPS synced. Um, or CDMA if you're in the US still. Um, SEC is a sonnet equi equipment clock. Um, sonnet is the synchronous optical network. It's also obsolete because it never scaled above 10 gigabit. It's not strictly true. There's a 40 gigabit standard, but nobody really implemented it. And synchronous data networks are these days mostly migrating to something called sync E. <coughs> Sorry. And that's happening as mobile networks upgrade to LTP. Uh, PTP. There's something called PTP. It's intended as a replacement for NTP. And for very, unless you're basically in a scientific lab, it's not really a value. Yes, I would have, I could add if you're another, there's a rather hilarious Nanog thread from about a month ago with a guy arguing to me that he needed his machines accurate to sub-microsecond levels to measure latency across his network. Uh, I pointed out to him he wasn't measuring latency, he was measuring buffer depth at that point. Yeah, by that point there's better ways to do it than PTP. NTP sort of tree-ish if you might if you do it that way. You don't need to and often don't. Anyway, I'm gonna sort of run through the last part of this slide. So, okay, it's all well and good that we can have this incredibly accurate timing. Why should we? Well, I mean from my perspective as someone who runs systems, well users are gonna complain if their clocks are out by ten minutes. Uh, Kerberos, used as the core of Act Microsoft Active Directory, many other old core directories, uh, will actually refuse to work if your clocks are out by more than five minutes. Now, of course, users actually complain if you've got more than zero minutes out. Why did this email take so long? Why am I getting email from the future? Of course, given that users also don't understand time zones very often, it doesn't necessarily help. Luckily, email clients mostly hide this these days. And log analysis is actually something really interesting. It's, I now work in an environment where this is impossible because it's actually not possible, for, as I mentioned before even, uh, I can't know the latency between any two points on my network to an accuracy small enough 
to do log analysis anymore. So I have to do it other ways. But back when I was running proxy servers in a cluster, they were all in one location, they were all in one rack. As long as I had them synchronized properly, they were within a millisecond of each other. So I pull up the same time on every log and I would actually see the same time. 30 milliseconds can be a huge amount of data. Um, I, I work on networks in the terabit per second range. It's actually doing the calculation of what goes on things I care during 30 milliseconds on things I care about is impressive. So we were chatting before and mentioned GMT and UTC. So GMT is an obsolete name. In practice, it's exactly the same as UTC for all practical purposes. Um, the official civil standard is UTC, or Coordinated Universal Time. Thank the French. And it's got a couple of sub-variants for astronomical time, solar time, smoothed out, smoothed out more. And there's also something called TAI, which is the actual atomic time. The difference between the two is leap seconds, and we will get to that right at the end. Time zones. Time zones are fun. There's something called the time zone database. The TZ database, the canonical database, used by nearly everyone except Microsoft. And keep it updated and pretty much everything is magic. Keeping it updated can mean no, being notified of changes literally hours before they occur. Governments like changing time zones on their people. Um, some of you might remember a couple of years ago, I was working for a voice over IP company at the time and in, in less than six months I had to do three daylight savings policy changes across, just in Australia. So, I mean, Delta, usually an hour forward in summer. Lord Howe Island, however, does 30 minutes. And both two, 20 minutes and two hours have been used. <coughs> now, again, if you've got the TZ database, all is golden. But you might have multiple. Uh, PHP, Oracle, Java, all notorious for bringing their own TZ databases along. Uh, if you're using Debian, these have mostly been patched out, fortunately. And then there's silly time zones. I mean, if, if you just think wave runs on the hour, I mean, well, of course you've forgotten about Adelaide, but yeah, who cares? And like, okay, so everyone's on the hour or the half hour. No. Now, at least everyone these days is only as bad as the quarter hour. I mean, historically we had 20 minutes, so not too bad. 25, I okay, guess, sure. 44, what's the trolling? 43 minutes and 8 seconds. Now, large scale, and I say large scale in the senses I had it back before I worked here, which is rather smaller. But the same still applies whether you've got half a dozen hosts in Iraq and that's your entire installation, or half a dozen data centers the size of the moon, it seems. So first you have some local timing masters. These are a couple of physical hosts with good clocks. These can be synced off the NTP pool. They can be synced off uh, GPS clocks if you want to do that, rubidium clocks if you want to do that. Honestly, if the NTP pool is down for a week, that's pretty surprising news in the tech community. If GPS is down for a day, that's probably on the front page of most newspapers. Not that newspapers will still exist. Um, there are NTP appliances you can buy. Most of them aren't all that good. These days, most of them are, let's buy an embedded motherboard, a GPS receiver unit, and let's install NTPD upstream on the board and put a shiny front panel. There are good ones. I cannot provide product endorsements while on mic. 
Um, and just synchronizing off, say, a rubidium standard is not great because you need, at least while they still exist, you need to have a source for knowing when leap seconds occur. And despite people, may, people may tell you otherwise, don't use virtual machines as time masters. Now, if you've got a lot of clients, you possibly need a distribution layer. And if you bought cheap NTP appliances, you might really need a distribution layer. Same basic rule when you're having masters. Just decent, good clocks. Um, the reason you only sync with three to five is it just so happens that's the way the NTP algorithm works, is you want three. Four is probably not great. Five is nice. More starts to actually degrade the algorithm. Slaves basically work the same. Your end machines, save them to the local masters or distribution, done. Now, NTP is distributed by most Linux distributions, has a local clock. You should turn it off on almost everything. Because otherwise, unless you've got good monitoring, you'll wake up in six months and discover one service 30 seconds out, and NTP is going, yep, I'm all great, I'm synchronized to myself. Virtual machines, they suck. Um, anyone who's ever tried to do timing on them, timing critical even to a couple of seconds, knows that's pretty bad. They've gotten a lot better. I, I would say check your hypervisor vendor. I'm lucky enough not to need to care. Most of my boxes have very, very expensive Intel PCs stuffed in the back of them. Now, if you're writing applications, for time zones, just use the operating system's time zone database. Store everything either as UTC offset plus offset or local time plus a time zone, some way that you actually have a hope of being able to fix things later. You really should. It would be lovely if the stuff I worked with was consistent. It would be wonderful. I wouldn't randomly look at something going, why is this 10 hours out of date? Oh, wait, that's the stuff in GMT. Um, yeah. At the very least, be consistent. If you can, if you can do that, then you can try and be correct. <laughs> so, for embedded developers doing little, little units, deal, um, work phones, my classic example. You might need to deal with time zones. The only real thing of note here is that you'd be amazed how many developers from the Northern Hemisphere don't understand the concept that summer goes over Christmas. Now leap seconds. So I mentioned before, mentioned a couple times, we occasionally put in an extra second. Or we take one away. But in practice, we pretty much always add one. So not every minute has 60 seconds. Some have 61. I believe there's even, in principle, an allowance for it to have 62. We've never needed that. And that would probably be hilarious if we ever tried. Every single time we have a leap second, there are hilarious stories of outages. The Linux kernel has had half a dozen. The last one, uh, what was that, end of 2012? MySQL, most instances crashed. Ah, yes. Um, yeah. The lesson here is unless you've got a really, really good reason, and nutters in the finance industry are one, slightly less nuttier examples exist at this level. Second is actually, not, is actually quite a bit of time. Um, just ignore it. Unix will basically lie and say a second went on for two seconds. For almost everyone, that's completely fine. And there was a vote to get rid of leap seconds. It failed. The next one is coming up pretty soon. Yes. Also known as fail in practice. Um, alrighty. I believe we're going to go to short break. So we're going to go to short break. Um, I'll leave my details here up there if anyone wants to reach me and not reach me now and 
we'll have a break and you can come up and ask questions if you like.